Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and pin Linda and myself. All right, I'm going to read the scripture passage for today. The passage is from Mark 1. It's verses 12 through 20. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boats mending their nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their nets. They left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. All right, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you this time. And we ask that you would speak to us, that you would guide us and help us to grow deeper in understanding of your word. We offer this time to you and ask your blessings upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're continuing to move now into Mark's gospel and following the ministry of Jesus. Baptism was a couple of weeks ago. We heard the call of some of the disciples from John's gospel. Now we're turning back to Mark, and we're going to watch how Mark plays out the story. And I think that what we see as Mark with Mark is that Mark just, he moves very quickly through, especially this part of Jesus's ministry in life. You know, the baptism happens in a sentence. The temptation happens in two sentences. Uh, Mark is moving quickly, immediately, immediately, immediately. And we'll find that throughout the whole gospel of Mark. He's only 16 chapters long, and he gets to the point. But I think what we discover is that he packs a good bit of meaning and packs a good punch in the few words that he uses to describe what's going on. And, uh, you know, when you have been doing this, like I have been following this storyline year after year, you tend to say, okay, when we're going to look at the baptism, when we're going to look at the temptation story, I'm going to go to Mark and I'm going to go, I mean, I'm going to go to Matthew and I'm going to go to Luke because they tell more of the story. But we decide, we find that Mark teaches us some things and includes some stuff that we might miss uh, if, we just, if we just ignore and say, hey, we're going to look at these other pieces. That in the few words, uh, Mark tells us a good bit about who Jesus is and what that experience was like. So verse 12 is, and the spirit, spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast and the angels waited on him. By the way, this is right after baptism. Baptism, then boom, he goes right into the wilderness. And um, we see the spirit is, is, it almost reads like the spirit is pushing him out there. <laughs> But the Spirit drives him, leads him, guides him into the wilderness. By the way, he would have been around the wilderness when he's baptized. When he goes to see John, John comes out of the wilderness to baptize in the Jordan. Geographically, he's in a, 
uh, convenient place. So he's baptized. The spirit leads him into the wilderness. And in the wilderness is the temptation. And, and Mark doesn't give us the details, but we know that he's tested. A part of that is to be tested by, by the devil. Uh, Satan is there to do that. But we know that he kind of passes the test. He gets through the test because he then launches out his ministry calling for people to, um, to live a life of repentance and to follow him. Um, so we see the spirit is leading him. And isn't that interesting to think about that the spirit leads him to the place of temptation. And so um, that's part of the spiritual journey that Jesus has to go through to be tempted. So he's in the wilderness for 40 days. And those 40 days call us back to other experiences. The, the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses on Mount Sinai for 40 days. Elijah was even, uh, when he's running, he's kind of in the wilderness for 40 days. And so it's connecting Jesus to the stories of the past. Jesus is going to experience this. He is the, he, remember, Jesus comes out of Egypt in Matthew's gospel. He ends up in the wilderness. Um, so it's connected. Jesus is living the story of the people. And then it tells us, Mark puts in here uh, that he was with the wild beast and the angels waited on him. And this is, this is that stuff in my sermon today that I told you guys that I still need Bible study is that I am learning from this stuff. Because like I said, in my experience, I would go to Luke, I would go to Matthew and miss the whole wild beasts. But what this tells us is that Jesus, for one, is by himself. There's nobody else out there except for the devil and the angels. Uh, but he's with the wild animals. But those people who are, are able to survive being with wild animals are righteous people. Daniel and the lion's den, right? Even the Psalms speak to that. Psalm uh, 91 talks about those who are... Um, uh, that God protects the righteous from wild animals. It calls us to Isaiah's peaceable kingdom. Remember, Isaiah gives us this picture of the lion laying down with the lamb. And so here is one who is experiencing this. And then there's the angels. The angels come and wait on him. And the good news is that he's not alone. God does not leave him or forsake him in the wilderness, that he has the strength and the care. And this tells us that Jesus is anointed. He is who every John claims him to be because uh, the angels are there to care for him. All right, Linda, that I broke right into that, uh, jumping into that. So I want to give you an opportunity to share. You know, I, um, I think if I retitled, which is my, my habit to do, I would call the time to, you know, it, it's not like these things, you know, Jesus is sort of meandered around waiting for this stuff to happen. This is, is, reminds us of a bigger plan. It reminds us, you know, he, he, it's a specific plan and God gets him from that baptism and kind of gets him out the door and, and moving into what needs to happen. And we see that We see that with um, the fact that he was went to the wilderness, and and that was a scary thing to do by yourself. And I think that that's why I think it's important. Mark mentioned the beast because you know he's out there on his own with no protection other than the fact that he has angels waiting on him, which again solidifies who he is because nobody else would have had that, and. Um, I liked our story, talked about, you know, the 40 days connections and, and things, but I think that really what I got from the overall story was Jesus appreciated the sense of urgency. You know, it wasn't like, okay, well, I'll come back to you guys that are fishing and we'll talk about this next week. It was like, we got to do this now. Now is the time. And I think it's harder for us 
in this day and age after all of these years to keep that feeling of urgency. But I think it's critical. I think that it's important that we understand that we need to act, not spend too much time in that ponder stage or is it convenient or not? And, and that we realize that, that we don't know how long we have to get this message out there. We don't know how long or what other people are going through that need to hear it. So we have to keep moving forward. And I think Mark does a great job there here in that because he moves us with such progression. And, and as when we get to when he starts collecting um, his disciples, I mean, I literally said, whoa, 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 I got to write this down, you know, because you start to get the Andrews and the Simon Peters and the, you know, and it doesn't read exactly like what it read in the other Bible chapter. So you're like, okay, I'm, you know, there's only so many at the end. I want to make sure I'm talking about, we're, you know, that I'm focusing in on the same people. But I thought that was good about Mark as well, because it made me stop. Like you said, Sean, it made me stop and think, wait, do I even know which disciples we're talking about here? So on the, in the perimeter of my, my Sunday school book, I was writing, okay, now when we talked about this before, we met this one and this one and this one. So now we're, these are these two and try to make those connections. And that's what starts to make some of the, the, the details of these Bible verses have a different meaning. You know, it, you can start to connect to them when you start to make um those connections between what we read in John and what we're reading in Mark about the disciples and who got picked when and how, who, how they found out. And so John the Baptist gets, you know, gets Andrew and Simon Peter and says this, Hey, you need to be following this guy. And then we find, and they did, but then we realized that life kept going and they were fishing, doing what they do for their livelihood. And Jesus said, no, 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 come on now. It's now, you know, it's, it's not like, okay, I'll come back for you later. And I think that that time to act is, is what I came away with it. And I thought Mark did a really good job of, of driving us from point A to point B to point C and just kind of keeping it moving along. So we got a sense of the urgency that Jesus understood. Yeah. And I think, I think you pulling out that the danger aspect the wild beast represents danger. And, um, and I think that's an important piece that probably also speaks to the urgency, right? That um, this is a dangerous work, and, but it's a necessary work. And Mark then kind of shares with that danger as he tells us that after John was arrested, you know? So John's thrown into jail for being John, you know, for proclaiming uh, the truth. And it hints to this is this is going to get you in trouble. This is stuff that's, that's dangerous. Uh, people aren't going to like it. There's going to be opposition. But that, that I think when we look at it speaks to this is really important here. What we're doing has um, the truth and allowing people to understand the true truth um, is necessary because uh, there's consequences who, with people who get caught up with the lies. So John is thrown into jail because um, he's a threat to power. He's a threat. Herod, Herod feels threatened by John and he throws him into jail. And then what happens, you know, um, because Herod says, I'm going to keep my word. That's important. He ends up cutting John's head off because his um, his daughter-in-law asks him to, you know, it, which is played, which is, who was manipulated by his wife because they don't like John. And uh, now Mark's going to give us the details of that later, but uh, Mark does not waste any of the papyrus. <laughs> He's, when he writes something, it's got meaning. There's a reason to it. We can go look at John's gospel and we feel like John just really goes on and on and on and on. Uh, his stuff is important too. But Mark is good. If he writes it, 
it's got some meaning because he's going to move quickly. And that setup of Wild Beast and John going into jail says there's consequences to this. There's opposition. This can be dangerous. So pay attention, be ready, and let's step into it. And trust God. I mean, it was dangerous for Jesus, but God took care of him. Uh, it's going to be dangerous for, I mean, I mean, they're going to crucify Jesus. We know that. Uh, but ultimately, God works in a more powerful way through that uh, to redeem all people. So, and, and I think also it talks about the fact that th this, this battle against evil and difficulties and danger is going to keep going. You know, it's, it's an ongoing thing. So you, you might overcome one thing and something else is very likely to pop up. So it, it's got to be something that's in the forefront of, of our thoughts. You know, we deal with relatively little, if any, danger, you know, and yet this is what Jesus and his immediate followers were dealing with all bit to the to the stress that we experienced due to the pandemic and everything and that that sense of you know what's going to happen and they had that all the time but for different types of reasons that you know they just didn't know at what point you know no one would have thought some young girl was going to suddenly say yeah I want John's head and all of a sudden he'd be gone I'm sure none of his followers ever thought it would come to that so but they lived under that tension and that anxiety we live under tensions and anxieties now and we can't let that keep us from the mission at hand. Yeah. And what I would say is it, when we think about danger with the pandemic, we, we're not thinking about let's don't be afraid of the pandemic and let's keep doing things like we should. Uh, no, that's not wise. That's, that, that's right. going to kill people if we do that. How we assess danger is that we, we can step away and do church differently and understand that's probably going to cost us, but we are being faithful and we can trust that God is going to see us through, even though we're now doing Bible study on Zoom, right? Right. You know, right. we're doing worship totally on Zoom and, and we've made it this far. God has been faithful, but yeah, it's risky. It's risky, but, it, but, but following into the other would be deadly. Much, much yeah. More deadly. And, and then and then Mark, as as only, I think, kind of feel like only Mark could do, in like one verse, he just covers pretty much all the good news. You know, it's just like he moves into the next thing. And in one verse, you know, he in 15, in Mark 1, 15, he says, and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. And think about how much time we spend, you know, and, and learning and, and internalizing and studying what's involved with this, the whole gift of this good news. And Mark just deals with it. Yep, this is it, folks. You know, the time is here. This is it. And, and, um, and I, I like the repent. And, you know, I'm a huge PBS person. And I, I, I have to laugh because immediately there's a show, there's a mystery show of Father Brown. I don't know if any of y'all have seen that. And Father Brown, the, you know, is, is always saying, repent. I mean, it is constant. He, he says it once. He says it three or four times to the villains in the, in the mystery, you know. And so it, I thought it's just so straightforward. And, you know, and repent is to change. You know, it's, it's to change. You can't go on just being the same. You got to at least change or make the effort to change. You may or may not be successful, but you, that's part of repenting is, making that attempt to change and be better and do what you know you're supposed to do. Yeah, it, Mark was direct. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it, the repentance is, uh, and you guys have heard me say this before, but it's the same, it's built off of the same word as metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is a physical transformation. And this is metanoa, which is a spiritual transformation. So as a caterpillar, is trans the transformation it goes through to turn into a butterfly is what Jesus is saying. Our spiritual lives have to transform in that way. We got to be ready. We have to transform our spiritual lives to now receive uh, the good news that God is bringing in Jesus Christ. In the same way that a 
caterpillar sprouts wings, the nose gets longer so that it can now fly and gather nectar from the flower. So we have to be transformed to be able to receive the truth and God's grace uh, in that way. Yeah, that repentance is, he's, he's saying change, you got to change. And we see that, we see kind of that lived out in his call for the disciples, right? Mm -hmm. He says to come follow me and I'm going to make you fish for people. I right. change your work from catching fish to now gathering people. And, uh, and you got to leave everything, right? And poor Zebedee, right? He's just let his sons just leave him in the boat. You know, it's kind of like, okay, you know, I guess I'll have to mend the nets now. And, uh, you know, and, and they, they leave that old life. And that's kind of that transformation, that repentance in the, in the lived out form is seen in the call of those disciples. And uh, yeah, sometimes they're going to get caught up and they're going to go back. John, uh, Mark, Matt, they all go back. Actually, Peter, after the resurrection, he's out there fishing, you know, and then Jesus is on the beach and calls him, you know, and um, but, but it's going to stick with them enough that they will change the world. You know, these disciples change the world. We're here today because Peter and Andrew and John and all of them live that life and they change the world. And uh, yeah, and that doesn't just happen flippantly. It happens uh, through the power of God and calling and, and taking that serious action to do that. Well, I think uh, referring back to what you talked about earlier in the church service as well, it relies on consistency, you know, that the Jesus needed the disciples to understand they needed to continue this. They, they needed to be there for the people, for the people to understand, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't enough for him to come in for the brief time he was there and do what he did but they needed to keep that information going out there. They needed to provide that consistency. And um, I think that that's, you know, that's important sticking with things and, and um, you know, and, and being there, being reliable, you know, making that information reliably available to people was huge. And Jesus needed them to keep doing that. And it, it's a natural instinct for them to head back to what they were familiar with before, you know, that because, it was, I can imagine they were like going, well, what do we do now? You know, even though they, they knew they should keep doing something, it was, it, isn't it kind of like you flounder and you're, you're not sure? Didn't we all feel that last spring going, well, how's this going to work and what's going to happen? And gradually you realize, well, that, you know, I'm going to be active, proactive, and this is going to happen. And this is, this is changing, but we can make that work, etc. And the disciples, we can't, we can't any um you know kind of regroup and then move forward and um, provide that consistency of message and a mission yeah they they walked with jesus they were with jesus every single day and uh and they weren't perfect <laughs> they didn't get it in fact it took them a while to get it so it's not that these practices we have to be perfect in doing the practices, it's that the practices help us to get closer to that. We're going to make mistakes. So, and so if you show up and you're doing, if you're walking with Jesus and you, and you make mistakes, you know, you're going to learn from that. You're going to get, Jesus is going to give you an opportunity to learn. And so uh, it's not that these guys were perfect, but they, they were walking, they were walking uh, with the one who was perfect and that then equipped them to grow and learn and change the world. You know, um, of course they were equipped with the Holy spirit and, and they had a lot of help of course, but, uh, it's that action and moving that, that, that gets them there. Uh, and there is the wilderness, the wilderness does, is a place. Um, and so sometimes we need that quiet 
isolated, getting away from life to kind of get in tune, right? And you might even be able to think of the post-resurrection as that time too, because Jesus told him to wait. Um, so he did go back to his old life, but it, Jesus had kind of instructed them to wait and they were to wait until the spirit comes. But we have to understand the appropriateness of when, when we're called to wait, when waiting is being faithful, and when waiting is just uh, making excuses, I guess. Uh, and we have to learn how to, to discern all of that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, man, Mark packs a lot in a couple of verses that, that kind of get us moving and, and, and going. So Linda, do you, do you have final thoughts? I, you know, I just, I just really, I just like Mark's directness. And I, I like the fact that he is, is basically saying, you know, let's cut to the chase. Here, here, here's the factual information. I know he comes back and we, we fill in with details and there's a lot of missing things that we need to and want to know that he's not put in between. But I, I, I think that the directness, the message of this is the mission, you know, it's not going to be easy, it may not be dangerous, but it's not going to be easy, but we need to get on with it. And we need to, to change, we need to drop what we're doing, so to speak, and, and change our focus so that we can be on mission with what we God intends for us to do, whatever that is. And I, and I think that Mark says that very concisely in these, in these verses. So. Yeah. Great. So we want to hear from, uh, from the rest of the group and a couple of things to think about are you know, Jesus calls the fishermen to kind of transform their lives to now gather people and what ways do you sense a calling and discipleship that, that, that God is asking you to transform your life. That's something you can think about. Um, maybe uh, what, is, what does the immediacy mean for you? What does it cost us today to follow Jesus? And what is the danger about following Jesus today? What's the cost? What's the danger? Or if you have just kind of other pieces that you want to uh, share about this, we would be glad to hear those now. Well, those are very deep questions, Pastor. I need time to ponder those. <laughs> but Time's <I'm> up. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think I do have a couple of thoughts as it relates to the wilderness. So if I'm correct, Jesus was already in the wilderness when he was baptized. So what we're reading now is his going deeper into the wilderness. Is that correct? So my thought about that, and, and as I heard Linda talk about the urgency of these verses, uh, what came to my mind was, um, Yes, we, we need to be intentional and deliberate with what we're doing in spreading the gospel, but perhaps it's time for, for us to go deeper. And when I say us, I'll say me. Perhaps it's time for me to go a little deeper into that wilderness. Maybe I'm just on the outskirts and I'm not quite pushing it enough. And then my second thought about the wilderness goes back to your sermon when you were talking about small groups. Um, because if you think about the wilderness and especially looking at these verses where we talk about wild animals, you, you know, it's a scary place to be. And I think one of the cool things about small groups and the accountability that you mentioned is that people help you get out of that wilderness or stay out of the wilderness. I know if I'm not coming on Wednesday nights, I had better, of course, let you know, Sean, but I know that Margie and the Weisses and the Divya, they're gonna call me out if I'm not there. So, you know, you have these people along with you to make sure that you're not out there in the wilderness. Yeah, they, they don't really call you out, but they certainly notice and miss you. 
Margie might call you out, but oh, oh, Linda Weiss calls me out. Do <laughs> like calls me out. <laughs> we want to make sure that you're well. Yes. They always say, "Are you all right? Like, where were you?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say that's a care. They're caring for you. <laughs> Absolutely, and it's appreciated. Yeah, I really like that about the the wilderness. I think that's. That's a really good way to think about it. My question is, okay, so Mark says Jesus was walking along the water, saw them, called them, and immediately they came. Then is it Luke where he, they talk about Jesus said, go throw your nets out and bring in the fish. And then, so that was a di kind of a different account. Then in John, John, uh, Andrew, it sees John the Baptist, and then he knows who Jesus is, and he runs and finds his, finds Peter and tells him that's where, is that where the name changes, where Jesus, so all, is this all the same time, or were they approached different times? So what I would say to that is, um, my counsel would be don't try to take every, the same stories of the four gospels and make it all mash up and work out perfectly. Now they do like, like in this lesson, it talks about how, you know, Mark, we, we jump from the wilderness to his, his ministry. But the, the, one of the writings said, well, it could have been that there's a big period of time that's in between that. And what I would say is John and Mark and Luke and Matthew are trying to teach us lessons with how they tell the story of the calling. And if they don't all match up perfectly, that's okay. That's just how they're re-accounting the story. And that's how they're telling the story. And their purpose is for us to learn something from how it happened. So in the same thing that the, res the, the, the four gospels all tell the story of the resurrection, but it's impossible for it to, for them to all be factually right about the, how it happened because it just, was there two women or was there three, you know? And so it's okay. What they are getting at is a truth uh, mm -hmm. that is, that is deeper than it playing out exactly how they say so um i would say just trust that um you know they are called and there's something to learn May maybe what happened with peter in the boat and let's go deeper happens at a different time or maybe mark just shortens it up or you know or maybe it, th these conversations are picked up differently um and you know it's it's hard to it's hard to make it all work but we can learn something and it's all scripture so we can learn something there's truth in all of it so i can't answer your question linda except for uh, the it, it, i thought it i thought it was odd because the, when i was studying this they say uh in one of the the studies that they said it that God called them more than once and and says that this was three different times and I always assumed it was once and it's just recorded differently by the that's the way I've always thought it and and this guy says no he he called them more than once so I just thought it was odd so I was wondering what your opinion was on that and you you kind of had one right <laughs> Yeah, my opinion, and it is an opinion, it's an opinion, is that uh, the way they tell, the way they tell their stories are not going to match up chronologically, and to me, that's okay. Yeah, me too. I trust it, but it is, I think, also, I can, I can approach it two ways, uh, that it is something to consider that maybe they were called a couple of times. You know, so I might sit with that for a little bit and think about what that might mean. Um, and the beauty of scripture, what I would say the beauty of scripture and the reason that um, 
even though I have two degrees in biblical studies and I've been teaching for 20 years that I still learn is the scripture is breathing. It's alive and it can teach me different things at different times. That's right. Spirit working through. And so that really sets it up to be able to do that. In um, December, I had a, a posted something on Facebook. It was like a daily scripture writing challenge. Just write down three or four uh, scripture verses. And uh, uh, towards the end of December, a few people told me they did it through the month. And one of those names, it was a Hindu name. So I was like, I, I personally messaged her and asked, I don't know you were a Christian. Did you do that? Did you write scripture all month? And she said, yes, I did. I've become a Christian. Uh, and uh, my husband is also a Christian now, but only a few members. The rest of the family is still Hindu. And uh, we have church services and my husband preaches at home. And I was so happy to hear that. Uh, things like that are unexpected. And I was reminded of this Jonah passage where he says, oh, these people are bad. They won't change at all. There's no use <laughs> preaching to them. Uh, I think they are, are they're like, they persecute Christians and they're ho so hard hearted. They won't change and things like that. And then I read this Jeremiah passage in this week. And he says, but if I say, I will not mention his word or speak anymore in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. And it just blew me away. That's how it should be the good news of the gospel. I cannot assume things about it or keep it to myself. I have to do it. It will be dangerous. Uh, only today I just realized Jesus' ministry in the beginning itself, it was dangerous. I was just in my head. Oh, he started preaching and then slowly opposition built up and he was crucified. No, it was dangerous in the beginning itself. So giving out the gospel, it is going to be dangerous. But uh, uh, the end, it said, uh, how willing are you to step out on faith and follow Jesus? How boldly do you respond to Jesus' call? Does the challenge excite you? Does the responsibility frighten you? Do the possibilities intrigue you? That was so such a blessing, those verses and those lines. Yeah. Um, I, I saw a connection between um, the Romans passage today and um, what what um, there was one section where they talked a lot about repentance in the lesson and what repentance meant. And the emphasis from my perspective was um, a change that is very visible. Um, it's, it, it's what you say and do. It's not just what you're thinking intellectually. It's how you actually put it into practice. And I think that's what... Um, Romans 12, 2 was talking about, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the ruin, uh, re renewing of your mind and offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Um, so to me, that's, that's all connected. Yeah, and I'm freestyling on my sermons, the next in this series, I'm not using lectionary, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, so that's a God thing that those connect. I think, yeah. I mean, I think it always is a God thing that, that can, yeah. but there's, uh, there is no connection with the lectionary and the Sunday school lesson with that passage from Romans. It's only that I chose that passage to speak to what I was speaking to today. Mm -hmm. So God can even work when I freestyle scripture passages. I think that happens frequently. <laughs> Bigger than me. Mm -hmm. um, something I read in a commentary that was talking about the wilderness 
uh, this commentator called the wilderness enemy occupied territory. <laughs> I just thought that was interesting and kind of um, for, you know, when we're dealing with the world in general, that's an um, interesting way to look at it. Not that the people are the enemy, but that Satan is out there. Yeah. Yeah, it is a retreat from safety too, right? You're, what is keeps you secure, and you're just kind of trusting that God is what keeps you secure. In that. mm -hmm. That's good. And Sean, what you say about these small groups now, that Divya, that you could find uh, such beauty in Jeremiah, and I did not this week. I read all those. And it took me back to the reason why I did not like studying Jeremiah in Sunday school. And I am going to go back and read them again and find the beauty that you found because I have people that are just, I, I couldn't get some of the visual out of my head from Jeremiah this week. It was hard. So thank you. That's this small group is that that helps me go back and I will read that again. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. All right. You guys are doing great. So next week is asynchronous Bible study. Do you know what that means? Yep. That means uh, we're not having class because <laughs> oh, of, of the business meeting. You have to do your studying yourself. That's the that's the new thing with online school is asynchronous learning is when the teachers just give assignments and the kids have to learn uh, on their own. So asynchronous <laughs> learning because of the uh, business meeting next week, and then the week after that uh, we will so. We're not going to go back and, and and teach the 31st lesson. You're going to learn that yourself, then we'll jump into the new one, which I think is a new section, should be a new section. Uh, so we want you to do that. And we, unless there's a lot of objection, when we start in the, what's that, maybe February 6th? Seventh. Seventh. We'll, we'll, we'll transition to live streaming our um, um, our Bible study. So it you'll still be on Zoom, and I would like you guys still to jump in on Zoom, but we'll live stream our Zoom so that other people can watch it in real time. So unless I receive a lot of major objections, that's that's what we'll do. And you know we've been recording and putting these on uh, Facebook and YouTube, so. The only difference is that it just will be available immediately. So just so you know, okay? Okay. All right. Well, continue to pray for our family, um, for Kara's dad as he uh, deals with the uh, reemergence of cancer and uh, the uncertainty of what that means. And remember Fred, Fred's in the hospital with COVID. So um Lift him up, continue to, to pray for him, okay? Sean, yes. you said at the beginning of the service that Fred had it for a while. How long has he had it? I don't know. I know he's been in the hospital over a week. So I don't, I don't know specifics. So, All right, let's pray, shall we? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time. We thank you for the blessings you give to us. Watch over us and keep us and help us to live faithfully to you. Bless what we have learned today and continue to teach us throughout this week. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. 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 Have a good